Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining this session. So it's probably like we just have a one session left after, so thank you for uh, staying for the whole day. Hopefully you're not too tired. So the program for today, uh, we're gonna take a look at building apps in Kubernetes, the unforgiving sea of containerization and the live server tools. So the idea behind this talk is really to take a look at various, various tools that are available for developers when they start their journey to um, developing into Kubernetes. So starting from you know, your a developer with a local environment and you want to go from building container to uh, developing and testing into Kubernetes. So uh, my name is Nick. Um, I work as a head of DevRel at Spectro Cloud. I've spent the last six years working on Kubernetes approximately in both the field of CNI, which is the network plugin, and the CSI. Uh, and I'm joined today with uh, by uh, Tyler. Hi everyone, I'm Tyler. I'm a principal software engineer at Spectro Cloud. I've been working on Kubernetes native projects uh, for a couple different startups between now and 2019. And so the agenda for today, we're going to start by digging into the inner loop development. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with this term, inner loop development. So we're going to define this a little bit. Um, then Tyler is going to explain the tool sets with the different you know, stages of the inner dev loop. Then we're going to take a look at a, um, into an application that we develop especially for um, this conference, or at least to show the different tool sets. Uh, this application is awesome. It's a dad jokes generator built as five different microservices. So you're gonna see it's pretty much, I mean, pretty overkill, but it's just for one purpose, which is showing you uh, the different lifecycle uh, stages, the different tools, and how you can start developing into Kubernetes without having to know all about the Kubernetes complexity. Okay, so let's start by defining the inner loop development. So when you are building a, um, an application as a developer, most of the time you're gonna start by developing on your local laptop. And um, at some point you do, you're gonna commit your code into a Git repository and eventually trigger some pipeline, some automation that can be managed either by you or by the enterprise. So strictly speaking, the definition of the inner loop, inner loop stops when you are um, creating a, uh, um, uh, a PR into the upstream repo um, repository, and then the code is pushed to your uh, upstream repository, and then an enterprise CID pipeline is triggered. Um, but with the current tendency, which is, which is shift things left, which means that, uh, who, who is familiar with this term, shifting things left? A little bit. Okay, so the idea of shifting left is kind of um, mirroring what's inside the enterprise repository, the different processes that are involved here into the local uh, developer environments so that you can test things early from end to end. So from um, here, writing the code, building, building container, testing uh, your container, testing the entire application, which also involves building uh, potentially your own pipeline and also including things like security, uh, compliance, and different policies, not only um, in the from the enterprise, but bringing this left into your developer environment. So the more you want to bring, the more agility you want to bring into your application um, you know, life cycle, the more left you're gonna shift, which means that as a developer, the more you're gonna use the enterprise tools into your local development. Okay, so onto the tools. Um, as we all know, the Kubernetes development, cloud native development is rapidly evolving. There are a million and one tools. There's probably a new one that just got published as I'm speaking. Um, and as we work, you know, it's just the process of developing software changes along with the tools. So. Uh, I'll show you a brief journey of that evolution and talk about some of the most useful or ones that we want to highlight. Okay, so on a scale of one to 10, uh, if your laptop broke right now, as a developer, how mad would you, would you be? Um, hopefully not that mad, but if your answer was closer to 10, then you might uh, want to consider some of these new tools, which is basically remote um, containerized development environments. So products like Codespaces or Gitpod or, um, uh, 
well, those are the two I can think about right now, but basically what they do is they provide portability and reusability and consistency to your development environment. I'm sure we're all familiar with the concept of, well, it works on my machine. Um, that's what we want to avoid. So you can encapsulate all of the dependencies for your build inside of a container, which is shippable and shareable. So this speeds up developer onboarding. Um, new hires don't have to spend forever installing all the requirements. They can just get started. It's also self-documenting. Um, so something to consider if you were on the 10 side uh, of my first question. And then when we're writing our code, when you're moving from just writing, your, your maybe prototyping your app locally on your laptop, you might not be thinking about how you're treating sensitive data and environment variables, but then as you sort of move along the spectrum from local dev to maybe deploying or um, unit testing in Docker Compose and then eventually um, Kubernetes, you need to think about how you're gonna extract that information, um, refactor your app so it's not hard-coded, and then you'll inject it later. Um, and as part of that, you wanna avoid committing anything dangerous or sensitive into your version control system. And pre-commit is a useful tool for that. You can put it in your dev container so that developers have no choice but to use it. And what happens is if you use, there's a million plugins, but one of them is Git leaks. If you use Git leaks and you try to commit, say, a, an API key, it'll get automatically blocked. Um, and then obviously, uh, or not, maybe not obviously, but the 12-factor app pattern is just something to always keep in mind when you're thinking about code. All right, so we wrote some code, and now we want to build it, and we want to test it. Um, initially, we might use Docker Compose, and you'll write a Docker file for your individual application, and then you might be pulling in third-party uh, integrations like a cache or a database service. And initially, it uh, can be quick and, and easy to spin up um, all of that infrastructure locally using Docker Compose, but then as you, your project matures or as you move closer or further from uh, development to production, you'll start thinking about deploying in Kubernetes. And Makefile for the last, I don't know, couple solid decades has been sort of the de facto glue layer to or do some of that orchestration um, in terms of building your images, tagging your images, cutting releases. Um, but I wanna highlight Earth, uh, Earthly and Earthfile. They describe themselves as uh, what happens if Dockerfile and Makefile had a baby. So it brings some of that portability, consistency, repeatability to your build uh, in the same sense that dev containers bring those same things to your development environment. Uh, what that means is that your builds and uh, everything that you wanna run in CI is actually running inside of a container. So there's never that issue of, oh, well, tests passed locally, but they didn't pass in the pipeline. Um, and it's really familiar, comfortable, Dockerfile-esque syntax. So sort of, a, yeah, something to look at. And then, all right, we're deploying in Kubernetes. Initially, it might be raw manifests, but then as things complexify, you inevitably start templating, or you might need to do environment-specific customization. And there's a bit of a philosophical war there about what, whether to use Helm or Customize is the, probably the two most popular. Um, I'll just say that if you're doing environment-specific changes, like minor tweaks based on dev stage or prod, Customize is the way to go. But uh, if you're doing more conv convoluted conditional logic, like enabling or disabling different components of your your stack, and that's based on user preference, I would go with Helm. And then again, there's always a shiny new tool, so I have to mention Q. Q is a uh, data validation language that can actually render its own Q spec from your manifest, so you can take your existing manifest and port it to Q easily, and it reduces boilerplate by 75%, probably out of the box. And then not only that, but it'll validate that your manifests are, are correct, so another thing to look at. Okay, so we've built our artifacts, we have our pipeline defined, and now we're gonna be developing in Kubernetes. That might be local. If so, Minikube, Kind, and K3D are all popular, fast, easy solutions to get a local Kubernetes cluster up and running. And if you're doing things perfectly and you've mocked all of your external dependencies, that might be all you need to do your, do your dev. But we all know that's a lofty goal and it might be hard to reproduce prod um, or a prod-like environment to the extent that you want locally. So then there's this exciting opportunity where you can basically have prod and local at the same time. That's what DevSpace, Scaffold, and Tilt offer. So the problem is it's hard to reproduce this convoluted cloud-native environment in your local Kubernetes cluster. Like you might want to reach out to um, a cache or like a cloud message queue, and you can't always bring that down to your local Kubernetes cluster. So um, what these tools offer, um, 
DevSpace and Scaffold in particular are a bi-directional file sync. So like the code in your IDE is going to be automatically synchronized with the container running in Kubernetes and on save. And you can, it's pretty configurable. So you can do all sorts of stuff. You can hook it up with a debugger. Um, but what this does is it bypasses the image build, the pain of image build and push. I think as devs, we're all familiar, of, you know, tapping our fingers and on the keyboard waiting for the image to go through and that's no fun. So massively improves developer productivity um, when you can avoid that. But the journey's not over here in Kubernetes, great. And now you've got to think about security. Um, secret management is, is, is key. There are a million solutions. I want to call out SOPS, Vault, and Trousseau. SOPS is client side and low barrier to entry. Vault and Trousseau are both server side. Uh, Vault is super fully featured, but quite complex. Trousseau, I would say, is most Kubernetes native. I'm not going to go into too much detail because there's a lot to unpack, but uh, SOPS is, is a good place to start. It enables GitOps flows really quickly and simply. It allows you to check sensitive information into Git, essentially, because it's encrypted. Um, you can just use a PGP key locally to encrypt your manifests, put it in Git, and then you can hook that up with, say, Argo CD, um, which is a quick and, and simple way, relatively simple, to get yourself into the GitOps pattern. Um, and speaking of, yeah, containers and Kubernetes, another thing you want is static linting. So Chekhov is a tool that you can use to lint your Docker files, HashiCorp configuration language, um, basically any static config against hundreds of security best practices. Uh, policies that'll tell you if you're you're not following, like if you don't have a user defined in your Docker file, for instance. And Dive is another tool you can use to uh, inspect your images, and it also has a beta CI uh, feature, which will allow you to basically fail at builds if your images are not being space efficient. So if you're bloated, if your images are too big, um, and not meeting certain usage thres thresholds, it'll fail the build. Um, all right, so if we've taken all this time to optimize our images and make sure they're secure, then we wanna make sure it's exactly those images that run in our cluster. And you do that by signing them, and then we'll elaborate more, but two tools for signing images are Cosign and Notary. Um, that brings us into the concept of SBOMs and vulnerabilities. So what's in an image? Well, it's whatever's in your code. And you can basically use tools like SIFT, GitPod, and TURN to look at all the dependencies entailed by your image and, and the code that's inside of it and create a record of, of what that is and it's useful for an audit trail and compliance. But then what you can do is you can plug those dependency lists into vulnerability scanning tools like Gripe, Trivi, and Claire, which compare those dependencies and the versions against known lists of uh, vulnerabilities. So there's like the GitHub advisory database or uh, the NIST national vulnerability database and they can pull in the output. So for instance, SIFT and Gripe, SIFT will generate the SBOM, Gripe will read the SBOM, it'll say, all right, these are the issues with your image and how critical are they? Hopefully yours won't have too many critical issues. Um, all right, but lastly, we want to verify that these images that we've taken all this care to um, build correctly are the images running in our cluster. You do that using a cluster admission controller. Caverno or OPA are both uh, valid options. Basically what you do is you create a cluster policy that will reject any image that doesn't match certain constraints. We'll see more on that in the demo. So now, what we're gonna do, whatever, I mean, Tyler mentioned a lot of def different tools. We're gonna see them, them live into a real life application. So, as I said, it's a bit of a silly application uh, generating that jokes app, and we're gonna turn it later with DevSpace into a Chuck, Chuck Norris <laughs> joke generator. Uh, so the idea is very si simple. We have decoupled this application into multiple components. Uh, in terms of out-of-the-box services, which means that this is something usually you consume, you don't develop, we have NATS, which is a, again, a CNC, uh, I believe it's a CNCF uh, project that is a message queuing system. Um, it is used by the joke server, which is providing an HTTP endpoint for the user to request a joke. As the user requests the joke, the joke server will publish a message on NATS. This message gets uh, picked up by the joke worker, and the job of the joke worker is to use the open AI API. So we're gonna use the GPT-3 model. I mean, everyone knows probably chat GPT at this stage, right? Um, 
and then this joke is going to be stored both in a MongoDB database and uh, will be also stored into a, into a Redis cache for super fast performance because we need to uh, generate you know thousand and thousand of jokes. Um, for I mean later, if you want to see the, I didn't go exactly in all the details of this app. This is just for your reference in terms of user workflow. But at this stage, I think it's the moment to start the demo and go into the different uh, stages. So here, you have the entire repository of my application. So classic Go project where I have a CMD folder with the, both the joke server and the joke worker. Every folder, in our case, equal one microservice. And then I've got another internal folder for library that uh, are essentially shared between the two components, the joke worker and the joke server. As you can see, this is all I have. I don't have anything related to NATS, MongoDB, or Redis because I'm consuming those services. And uh, my job as a developer is to test my um, joke server and worker code against those services. Now is how can I deploy this into Kubernetes, right? So typically you start with local Docker. So here I've got a make file. The rule of that make file, essentially I've got different targets. Um, the rule is to create, um, facilitate container build, facilitate uh, the Docker compose. If I look quickly into it, compose. Like I've got a macro here to build all my application locally and deploy it into my local uh, Docker daemon. We're, gonna, we're not gonna go into that because what we are interested in is Kubernetes. But first, just to give you some context, uh, I'm gonna show you a quick Docker file here, which is not ideal because typically you would do like a multi-stage build to make the, the image slimmer, but at the same time, it will give us the, the opportunity to see like the result for the SBOM and all the vulnerabilities of doing so compared to a distro-less you know, multi-stage uh, container. The only thing I'm doing really here is building the code. And then with the joke worker, same thing, where I'm just building the code from uh, the, the Docker container. So I've got two Docker files into those two uh, folders. And then this is where I want to start deploying things. So I've got a deploy folder where I'm gonna be um, walking through you through the dev space configuration because this is the tool we are going to use today. So it really looked like a Docker, sort of a Docker Compose YAML file. So everything is in YAML. And the idea of dev space is to provide um, wrappers around your code so that you can effectively and efficiently deploy that into Kubernetes. So we're gonna start here with the syntax of importing images. So you have an images section where you just specify the image, the Docker file, and the context. So very easy. With this, you can build the image. Uh, in terms of the deployment, here this is where we're gonna specify I want um, MongoDB. So it's gonna be using Helm, as Tyler was explaining. You can use Helm, you can use Customize as well, and you can use also you know, static manifests to deploy all the, the components uh, using dev space. So in our case, we have MongoDB for MongoDB. We have the Redis operator to deploy uh, a Redis database uh, or cache. We have NATS to deploy NATS. So all of that is taken, as you can see, from the official you know, out-of-the-box Helm repositories. So it's just like copy-paste of those uh, URLs. And then we have the joke servers and the joke worker. Um, this is the custom part, like this is the code I'm building. And what um, DevSpace does is also integrates with um, a, another Loft um, product or feature which is called Component Chart. It basically um, allows you to wrap the container image direct, directly into a Helm chart without having to build the whole chart. So it saves you time. As a developer, you don't necessarily want to deal with Helm charts, right? Because this is typically the role of the platform team or the DevOps team. Here, just by specifying um, the, um, this repo, it's gonna wrap the image into a Helm chart while at the same time allowing you to customize and add environment variable to, param to, to uh, 
add extra parameter to your application. So in our case, for example, we have the joke server where we need, uh, so the container image definition, as well as define the NAT URL as an environment variable. And same thing, the joke worker will need extra components, extra environment variable, like the URL again, the Mongo URL, Redis URL, as well as the open AI API key. And which brings me to um, SOPs. So Tyler mentioned SOPs as a tool um, to encrypt your um, uh, sensitive information from the client side. So what you want to do is use SOPs to encrypt and then commit it to your Git repository. And at the same time, you want to install pre-commits with Git leaks so that if you commit by, you know, like by mistake, um, the unencrypted file, then you have an error message. So here, for example, I'm just uh, creating the a config map in Kubernetes that defines the open API key that is unencrypted. And if I try to commit this, so git add this file, and then commit, you can see that it's detect detected by git leaks, preventing me from effectively committing that unencrypted file um, into, into my repository. So it's always like starting from my own laptop so that I'm sure, you know, when I was talking about shifting left, it allows me to detect that mistake before committing to the upstream, I mean, or to do a PR into the upstream repository, right? Um, and then DevSpace provide also some hooks that allows you to use the SOPS-D, which is to decrypt this file before deploying everything into Kubernetes, because of course you need to decrypt that to make it a resource readable into, into Kubernetes. All right, then uh, you also have the ability to use uh, custom resources here, because um, all the, you know, the operators I've used such as the Redis operator, the MongoDB operators, they need static manifest to define the databases and options such as, you know, like the size of the database, the permissions. So typically this is some boilerplate you can copy paste from GitHub repositories and, you know, just some config, extra configuration. And so what I'm gonna do now, I've got my empty uh, Kubernetes cluster there with a dev namespace. Uh, and what I want to do is use dev space in dev mode, which is, has some nice feature like uh, that uh, Tyler mentioned before with the file synchronization, also av uh, avoiding rebuilding the image every time you, you change code, but at the same time having the new binary into, into uh, running into your container. So I'm running this. Oops, sorry, I need to go to the right directory. So if we take a look at it, it should deploy all the, com start deploying all the components I've mentioned, starting with MongoDB, Redis, as well as NATS, and our, um, our own code, so the joke worker, joke server. You can see some, um, you know, like red uh, portion here, which is like dependency on some services, but eventually Kubernetes is based on reconciliation, so when, when all the services will be up, then the whole application should go without any error. Okay, so now it's um, running, and I can start actually generating some jokes. So as I was saying, we can see here that it's, uh, if I go into service, So my application is running on port 8080, the joke server. So I can just do some, uh, let's generate maybe just uh, five joke. Okay, cross finger, is it working? Hopefully, yeah. Okay, so now it's generating, generating joke from uh, the GPT-3 model. And the next step will be to try to modify the code live so that our application is not generating dad jokes, but Chuck Norris jokes, which may be more fun, I'm not sure. 
Okay. Uh, there's one last thing I didn't mention. Sorry about that. I forgot. Um, the last step for dev space. So we've seen that you can deploy, you can define the different images, and then you can also control the order in which you deploy the different components. And for that, you have the dev section here that define um, a series of macro. And the one we are interested in is create deployment, which is calling out the different names for the different uh, deployment items in a specific order. So in my particu particular case, um, to be able to deploy the custom resources, so all the um, custom resource corresponding to Redis, corresponding to MongoDB and NATS, for this to be valid in Kubernetes, I need first to deploy the different operators. So the, the role of the operators in Kubernetes is to extend the API to make those external components first-class citizen in Kubernetes. Of course, if I deploy the custom resources before the operator and the custom resource definitions are present in the cluster, that will fail. So here, DevSpace gives you this extra granularity to, to really you know, control how you want to, to deploy that application. Thanks, Nick. <clears throat> okay, so now on to kind of showcasing the power of DevSpace, uh, or where it really shines. So like Nick said, we're gonna show you a live code reload and how that bypasses what I was mentioning, the pain around the image build and push, uh, which is typical of a you know standard dev lifecycle. So I'll scroll down to the sync config yeah, and you can see here what we've done is inside the joke worker, we've enabled this restart helper. Um, and, well, actually, sorry, before I go into that, I'm just gonna change the code, and then, and then we'll, we'll dig into the config a little bit. Um, so, inside the internal folder, we've got our joke implementation. All right, no more dad jokes. Tell me a Chuck Norris joke. Um, and just really quick, uh, before I do that, I'll just show you inside this pod, this is where the joke worker is, I can shell in, and I can cat the internal joke joke file, grep for that same line, we can see, okay, in this container, it's still saying dad joke, um, as we expected. Oh, yeah, and uh, if we look at the processes, as I was pointing out, we have that restart helper enabled. So the PID one here is that restart helper. And what that does is it makes it so that we can reboot our actual process that we care about, which is the joke worker, which you can see is PID 254. Um, and I'll, I'll dig into that in, in a second as I show you the config. So um, back to our dev space file. As I said, we enabled the restart helper. Um, and what we, it'll do is it'll execute a certain command every time we upload a file. So the on upload hook is where we define that. And what we'll do is we'll restart the container, but we're not gonna really restart the container, we're gonna restart our specific process running in that container that's executing our code. So what we'll do is we'll run go build um, on this to rebuild the joke worker binary and we'll execute it. Um, and then there's more stuff in the sync config, so to unpack it a little bit, we can say exactly which paths we wanna synchronize. We might not wanna synchronize all the paths in our repo, so you can lay that out here. And so this is a mapping between the local file system and the remote container. Um, so we're only copying in our dependencies inside go.mod and some of the source code we need like that internal folder. So um, I've made my change. I wanna see Chuck Norris jokes. Okay, now, um, let's just ask for some jokes. And let's see 15. <clears throat> Maybe these are hopefully a little bit funnier than the dad jokes. Um, I'll let you be the judge though. So uh, while that's running, what we'll do is we'll just take, take a quick look at the logs for the joke worker. So it says killed restart container. Um, and that's that restart helper that I was showing you. But it, if you look in reality, it's been up this whole time, the same amount of time as all the other pods. So it didn't um, actually get killed. But what we can do is shell back in and look at the processes. And if you remember, I think it was 254, but now the joke worker process is 349. 
So the dev space restart helper uh, rebooted it after a recompile with our, our new code and there was no image build. Um, and I can also grep for that same line and there you go, Chuck Norris. So that's pretty cool, at least I think it is. Uh, really speeds up your workflow as a developer. Um, and yeah, it's just generally a pleasure to use, fun tool. Um, okay, so now we have our images, we know how to deploy them, we know how to develop um, quickly and easily using um, dev space, but what we wanna do is we wanna show you SBOM and um, uh, vulnerability scanning using Gripe. So we'll use SIFT and Gripe. Um, if I just show you the list of images we have locally, you can see that we have this joke, uh, joke worker image. Now I wanna know what's inside of it. So um, I have previously executed this command to save the SBOM to the file system. This is sort of the machine readable format um, in JSON format, it's very verbose. Um, I've done that already though, and so instead I'll show you the human readable format, which is a table. And we'll load the image and within a second here, we'll see all the different dependencies inside that, that uh, all the dependencies pulled in by our image and the version and what they are. So here you go. And then if you wanted to see the same thing in that more verbose JSON format, that's in the file. And that's what we need for Gripe to actually match up all of these dependencies against the vulnerability database. So now that we have that SBOM saved to disk, I can use Gripe and Gripe will read in the SBOM and tell us if we have any issues. So because Nick didn't use a multi-stage uh, build in his Docker file, like, you know, best practices would be to first compile your code inside of a build stage and then copy that into a, like a final stage that's using, say, the distro-less image so that it's as slim as possible and lacks vulnerabilities. But as you can see here, we've got all of these different vulnerabilities, and you can look these up easily online to see exactly, you know, what what the what the issue is, and then if there's a fixed version, it'll be here in this column in the middle, so you can know exactly what you need to update to remediate. Um, okay, so we've done our best. Our image is as you know secure as it can be, and now we want to sign it so that we can ensure that inside our cluster we're running that signed image. Uh, what we've already done previously is deploy Kyverno. So I can show you we have the Kyverno admission controller that was just deployed using Helm install and it's ready to help us protect our cluster. So what we'll do is we'll create a custom resource called a cluster policy. And the cluster policy just indicates how it is that we want to enforce, you know, which images are needed to, need to be signed under which context. So I'll show you the cluster policy. So what this means is under image references, we're gonna match on any images that are coming from the V55 Docker um, repository, which is Nick's repository. And so for any image, uh, or sorry, any container using that image that's inside of a pod or a deployment in the cluster, we're going to use this attester to attest that that image has been signed properly. And we do that using SigStore. And it uses uh, Google OIDC under the hood uh, through Nick's Gmail account. So basically what we've said is um, make sure any, any images that are supposed to be coming from this repo are signed. All right. Um, Let's sign an image. So if you remember, I was talking about cosine. Um, we have that image locally, and we are now going to put our stamp on it saying that it is good. And this is keyless. Uh, there's also, uh oh. Don't know where that opened up. Let me try that again.
Okay, so you could optionally sign using a, like a, a PGP key. Um, however, there's this nice keyless option which just uses Google OIDC that we're relying on here. So it opened up my browser and basically now I'm authenticating as, as Nick through, through Gmail and now that's saying, okay, um, we're gonna create a signature and we're gonna upload it to what's called the record transparency log, but um, later we can use that to validate. So now that's available and our image is signed. We can verify that it's signed using cosign verify. And this will tell us, okay, yes, what we just did worked and we get this big JSON blob here that I'm not gonna unpack, but essentially uh, what this means is that that image is as we expected, has our stamp on it, and now we can basically use that cluster policy to, to block it. So I created the cluster policy as you, you saw a few minutes ago, and now what I'll try to do is I'll run an image that's tagged with the unsigned tags. So this is a different tag from the one that I, that I um, recently created the signature for, and it'll get blocked. And I'll just show you in the Kyverno admission controller logs. It failed. Manifest unknown. So that's an example of how we can protect our clusters from man in the middle attacks. All right, so now just to tidy up, I will delete the cluster policy and then show you how, and so this whole time this was all running through dev space, I'll just quit dev space and do dev space purge. And just like that, everything we had up and running in Kubernetes gets torn down and it's all cleaned up. Okay, so I guess that uh, concludes our demo. We did everything live and it worked. So it's a happy day. We had the video just in case, but we didn't have to use it, so I'm very happy about that. So the, just a few uh, key takeaways for today. So we've seen that developing cloud native application is not necessarily an easy task, but now we have tools that we as developer can use for abstracting some of the Kubernetes complexity with things as easy as Docker Compose back in the days. Um, because I do believe for a full adoption of Kubernetes, developers need to use Kubernetes as a target to develop, to develop their application. Otherwise, it will never have full adoption. We always say Kubernetes has to be boring so that we have the full adoption and it crosses the chasm. But without a full developer experience with the right tool sets, we won't reach that, st that state. And I think today we do have the tools to make it a reality. So if you want to implement this sort of you know, new tools into your developer environment, the first thing to do is don't overkill it. Don't do the same thing as we, <laughs> we did, like if you need to build that joke generator, uh, maybe don't use microservices, <laughs> right? Uh, but yeah, start small and just in you know, increments and make things that are really uh, useful for your business. Try to shift left as much as possible, especially including things like security, compliance, storage networking, bring all that into your local cluster as soon as possible, um, as early as possible so that when you come into the enterprise CICD cycle and with all the CICD pipelines, almost 80% you know, of the job has been done already. Uh, and finally, when you are developing with those remote containers, make it, as Tiger mentioned, everything is shareable, portable, shippable, because sharing is caring. I added some cat picture there, because otherwise the presentation without any cat picture is not really a cool presentation. Okay, but we're both from Spectre Cloud and uh, didn't really say anything about Spectre Cloud that whole time, which you might be wondering. Um, basically, Spectre Cloud is a, uh, Day zero through two Kubernetes management platform. So well, once you're in prod, maintaining that cluster might be more of a challenge than you anticipated. Uh, what we can do is orchestrate Kubernetes environments on private cloud, public, or, uh, sorry, private data center, public cloud, or at the edge. Uh, not only that, though, it's not just the infrastructure and the OS and, and Kubernetes, but it's also the application stack. So we have the, what we call the Palo Developer Experience. Uh, 
which allows you to model your app in what we call an application profile. <coughs> you can see here is a screenshot from our UI where we've taken that whole app and we've modeled it within that the palette developer experience as these, these different tiers. And the tiers can share configuration information with one another, just like you do in uh, dev space or like how we showed you in our demo. However, this is repeatable. You can take that application profile and stick it into whatever cluster you want, whether that's in any of those environments that I just mentioned. And we have a free credit program. If you want to check this out, uh, feel free to check the link. And just a quick review of all the tools uh, that we use today. A bunch of them are up there. We didn't explicitly call out K9S, but that's all maybe one of my, my favorites. That was the, uh, the Kubernetes user interface or the TUI that we were using to navigate Kubernetes. It's a lightsaber. If you use it too much, you might also forget how to use kubectl though, so be careful. Uh, but yeah, brief overview of everything we did. Check out the link to see what Palette has to offer. And final thing is uh, yeah, cluster API. Um, kind of how we do that day zero through two orchestration that I was mentioning is we call it the cluster API. It provides continuous reconciliation of Kubernetes every two minutes. We'll basically detect what it is you have and match it against the desired state and use that to maintain your Kubernetes environment. Uh, like me for checking out.